This podcast was sponsored by King James and the Twelve Disciples. Just kidding. Welcome back to this episode of Growing Up Fundy. I am your host, Sydney Davis Jr. Jr. And guys, I am excited. I am very excited about this episode. So I just want to get through this intro as fast as possible, just to kind of introduce what's going on and then jump right into it. So basically what's happened is I have found something that has apparently been around since 2007. I have no idea how I didn't know this existed. I'm so glad that I found it. But basically what we're going to go over today is in 2007, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, and Christopher Hitchens apparently sat down for a two-hour discussion. And I found it. I found all of the audio and the video. It's available for free online. It is available both on YouTube. It's also available through Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. They just plopped this on the internet for free. And I think it's fantastic that this resource is out here available for us to just consume um, free of charge. I think that's amazing. So what I've done is I have basically gotten the audio from both hours and I'm going to divide it into two separate episodes and I'm going to play it for you so that you can listen to it. I'm not going to interject with commentary. I'm not going to give my opinion in the middle of it or anything like that because I don't want to at all sway what parts you believe and what parts you don't believe or what parts you agree with and what parts you don't agree with. This is not an exercise in trying to convince you that any belief system is right or that you should agree with 100% of what they're saying. I just think this conversation is really amazing, very thought-provoking, very interesting, and it's from four of the most prolific voices in the religion debate space, I suppose you could say. I don't want to say the atheist space because I would not necessarily say that all of these people consider themselves atheists. But let's do a little introduction for people who maybe have never listened to this before or aren't familiar with who I'm talking about. So let's start with Richard Dawkins. He's a British evolutionary biologist and author. He is apparently an emeritus fellow of New College Oxford and was professor of public understanding for science in the University of Oxford from 1995 to 2008. He is an atheist. He is well known for his criticism of creationism and intelligent design. So that's who Richard Dawkins is. I highly recommend you check out some of his books on bookoutlet.com because everything is very cheap on that website. I buy all my books from there. Who is Sam Harris? So Sam Harris is the youngest member of this group. Um, He's currently 54. But Sam Harris is an American philosopher, neuroscientist, author, public intellectual, and podcast host. So he covers a wide range of topics, including religion, rationality, ethics, all sorts of things. He's a very, very smart guy. I would argue one of the most intelligent people alive right now. And um, he is an authority in the atheism space as well. Then we have Christopher Hitchens. Christopher Hitchens was a British American author, journalist, orator, and columnist. He wrote, co wrote, edited, and co edited over 30 books, including five of essays on culture, politics, and literature. And he is the first one that I was ever familiar with in terms of an outspoken atheist. In fact, he has been known to call himself an anti-theist as opposed to just an atheist, which I think is interesting. If you haven't listened to one of the past episodes, I actually go through the difference between atheism and anti-theism. So that's Christopher Hitchens. Again, he's written a bunch of books. I highly recommend checking them out. They're very, very interesting. Very, they make you think. And then finally, Daniel Dennett. Um, He is an American philosopher, writer, and cognitive scientist whose research centers on the philosophy of the mind, philosophy of science, and philosophy of biology, particularly as those fields relate to evolutionary biology and cognitive science. So that's just a little bit of background on the gentleman who you're going to be hearing from in this episode. And I highly encourage you to look up their work separately if you enjoy what you're hearing in this hour of uh, this first hour, I suppose, of the roundtable that they had. 
And then uh, soon I'm going to post part two so that you can continue listening to the second half. But I feel like the first half is just a lot to digest and it's a lot to kind of take in and think about. So I wanted to give some space between these two episodes being posted back to back um, and see your opinion. Again, this is not me trying to get you to agree with them. Feel free to disagree with them. Feel free to dislike anything you hear. Feel free to pose any kind of questions or rebuttal of any sort to the content that you hear today. This is not me trying to convince you that this is an absolute or this is 100% correct or the way that you should believe. This is just a very, very interesting insight into some of arguably uh, the most intelligent minds and some of the most um, well-known and renowned voices in the atheism space and the anti-theism space and the theism debate space. So I wanted to share it with you and it's free and consumable online. Anyway, um, enough of my voice. Let's get into it. One of the things we've all met is the accusation that we are strident or um, arrogant or, or vitriolic or shrill. Uh, what do we think about that? Yeah, well, um, I'm amused by it because I went out of my way in my book to address reasonable religious people and I, I test flew the draft with, with groups of students who were, who were deeply religious. And indeed, the first draft uh, uh, incurred some real anguish and so I made adjustments and made adjustments and it didn't do any good in the end because I still got hammered for uh, for being for being rude and aggressive and I came to realize that it, it, it's a no-win situation it's it's a, it's a mugs game the religions have have contrived to make it impossible to disagree with them critically hmm. without being rude without being rude we, you know they they, they sort of play the hurt feelings card at every opportunity and you, you're you faced with the choice of, well, am I going to be rude or am I going to Say articulate like, this yeah, criticism? Yeah, yeah. I mean, am I going to articulate it or am I, am I just going to button my lip? And, and Right. Well, that's what it is to trespass a taboo. I think we're, we're all no, encountering no. the fact that, that religion is, is held off the table of rational yep. criticism in, in some kind of formal way, even by we're discovering our fellow secularists yep. and our fellow atheists. You know, just leave people to their own superstition, even if it's yep. uh, abject and causing harm. I don't look too closely at it. Now that that was, of course, the the point of the title of my book: is there is this spell, and we got to break it. But if the charge of um, mm -hmm. offensiveness in general is to be allowed in public discourse, then Without self-pity, I think we should say that we too can be offended and insulted. I mean, I, I'm not just uh, in disagreement when someone like Tariq Ramadan mm. accepted now at the high tables of Oxford University as a spokesman, says the most he'll demand when it comes to the stoning of women is a moratorium on it. I find that profoundly much more than annoying. Right, yeah. Um, insulting, it, insulting it, not only insulting, but actually threatening. But you're not offended. Um, this is I, you don't take any. I don't see you taking things personally. You're alarmed by the the liabilities of certain ways of thinking, as in Ramadan's yes, case. But, but he would say, or people like him would say, that if I doubt the historicity of the Prophet Muhammad, I've injured them in their deepest feelings. Right. Well, I'm I'm I am in fact. I think all people ought to be offended, at least in their deepest integrity, by say the religious proposition that without a supernatural celestial dictatorship, we wouldn't know right from wrong. That we only, yeah. we only uh, live by... But are you really offended by, by that? Doesn't it just seem wrong no, to I, you? No, I say only, Sam, that if, if the um, offensiveness uh, charge is to be allowed in general and arbitrated by the media, then I think we're entitled to claim that much without being self-pitying or representing ourselves as yeah, an oppressed minority, right. which I think is an, op yeah, an opposite yeah. danger, I, I would yeah. admit. I'd, I'd like to add also that... Um, that I agree with Daniel that there's no way in which the charge against us can be completely avoided because what we say does offend the core, the very core of any serious religious person at any rate. If we, if we deny the divinity of Jesus, for example, that many people will be terrifically shocked and possibly hurt. It's just too bad. I'm fascinated by the contrast between the amount of offense that's taken by religion and the amount of offense that people take against really anything else, like your artistic taste, your taste in music, mm -hmm. your taste in art, uh, your politics. You mm -hmm. can be not exactly as rude as you like, but you can be far, far more rude 
about such things. And I'd quite like to try to quantify that, to actually mm -hmm. do research about yeah. it, actually it test yeah. people with, with statements about their favourite football team or their yeah. favourite piece of music or something, yeah. and see how far you can go before they take offence, compared to, is there anything else, apart from, say, how ugly your face is, yeah. Um, yeah. that gives right. such... Or your husband's or wife's or girlfriend's oh, yeah, yeah, or partner's yeah, yeah. face. Yes. Well, yeah. as a, it's interesting you say that. I, I regularly debate with the terrible man called John Donahue of the um, Catholic Defense League. And he actually is righteously upset by certain trends in modern art, um, right. which tend to draw attention to themselves by blasphemy. Well, For example, Piss Serrano's, Christ, yeah. Serrano's yes. Piss Christ or yes. the elephant down on the Virgin. And, so, and indeed, I, th I think it's quite important that we share uh, with Sophocles and other pre-monotheists a, a revulsion to desecration or to profanity, that we, we don't want to see um, churches uh, desecrated or mm. no, uh, indeed not. religious icons yeah. uh, trashed and so forth. That yes. we, we share an admiration for at least some of the aesthetic achievements of religion. Right. I, I think this, this whole notion of, I think our criticism is, is actually more barbed than that in the sense that we're not, we are offending people, but we're also telling them that they're wrong to be offended. I mean, this is, it, yes. Yes. Yeah. physicists don't, yeah. aren't yeah. offended when, when their view of, of physics is disproved or challenged. I mean, this is just not the way uh, rational minds operate yeah. when they're really trying to get at what's true in the world. And religions purport to be representing reality, and yet there's this peevish and, and tribal and ultimately dangerous reflexive response to having these ideas challenged. I think we're, we're pointing to the, the total liability of that. Well, fact. and two, there's no polite way to say to somebody, you've wasted your do, life. Do you realize <laughs> you've wasted your life? Um, do you realize that you've just devoted all your, your efforts and all your goods to the, the, the uh, a glorification of something which is just a myth? Right. Uh, or have you ever considered, the e even if you say, have you even considered the possibility that maybe you've wasted your life on this? There's no, there's no inoffensive way of saying that, yeah. but we do have to say it because they should jolly well consider it. Same as we do about our own lives. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Dan Barker's making a collection of clergymen who've lost their faith, but don't dare say so because it's their only living. It's the only thing they know yeah. to, what to do. I've and, heard and from one of them at least. Have you? Yeah. Yes. I used to have this when I was younger in arguments with the members of the Communist Party. They, they sort of knew that it was all up with the Soviet Union. Mm. <laughs> Many of them had suffered a lot and mm. sacrificed a great deal and struggled you know, manfully to keep what they thought was the great ideal alive. They, they, their main spring had broken, but they couldn't, they couldn't give it mm. up because it would involve a similar concession. Right. But yep, that right. certainly, um, if anyone said to me, how could you say that to them about the Soviet Union? Didn't you know you were going to really make them cry and hurt their feelings? I said, don't be ridiculous. Don't be absurd. But it's, 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 I find it. In many cases, almost an exactly analogous argument. When, when people tell me I'm being rude and, and vicious and uh, terribly aggressive in a way that I should, I'd say, well, if, if I were saying these things about um, the, the pharmaceutical industry or the oil interests, yeah. uh, would it be rude? Would it be off limits? No. Of course it wouldn't. Right. Well, I want religion to be treated just the way we treat the pharmaceuticals and, and the oil industry. I'm not against pharmaceutical companies. I'm against some of the things they do, but I just want to put religions on the same page with them. In, including denying them tax exemption. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And or in the English case, uh, state subsidy. I'm curious how religion acquired this charmed status that it has mm -hmm. compared to any of these other things. I mean, somehow we've all bought into it, whether we're religious or not. And mm -hmm. that some historical process has led to this immunization of religion against well, this, this, hi this, this hyper of offense taking that, that religion is allowed to take. And what's particularly um, uh, uh, um, I, amusing to me finally, at first it infuriated me, but now I'm amused, is they've managed to enlist legions of non-religious people who take offense on their behalf. And how. In mm -hmm. fact, or, yes, the yeah. most vicious reviews of my book have been by people who are not themselves religious, but they're terribly afraid of hurting the feelings of the people that are right. religious, mm -hmm. and they, they chastise me worse than anybody exactly who's actually religious. Exactly my experience, exactly my experience. And I think so one of you pointed out how condescending that view is. That yes, the, the, yes. The, it's as though, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's like the idea of penitentiaries. I mean, they're, they're, 
other people need them. You know, that That's we right. must yes. keep these people yes. safely in their midst. Yep. Yes. Yes. Um, well, I, I think there's one answer to that question, which which may illuminate a difference that, that or at least a difference that I have with with uh, uh, I think maybe all three of you. I, I, there's something about. I, mean, I still use words like spiritual and mystical without furrowing my brow too much, and I admit mean, to the consternation of many atheists. Um, I think there is a range of experience that is rare and that is only talked about without obvious qualms in religious discourse. And, and because it's only talked about in religious discourse, it is, it is just riddled with superstition and, and it's used to cash out various metaphysical schemes, which it can't reasonably do. But clearly people have extraordinary experiences, whether they have them on LSD or they have them because they were in, alone in a cave for a year or they have them because they just happen to have the neurology that is, that is particularly labile that, that, that allows for it. But people have self-transcending experiences and people have the best day of their life where everything seemed, you know, they seemed at one with nature. Sure. And, for, and for that, it, it, because religion is, seems to be the only game in town in talking about those experiences and dignifying them, everyone, that's one reason why I think it, it seems to be taboo to criticize it because you're talking about the most important moments in people's lives and trashing them, at least from their view. Well, I don't have to agree with you, Sam, in order to say that you're, it's a very good thing you're saying that sort of thing because it, it shows that, as you say, religion is not the only game in town when it comes to being yeah. spiritual. It's like it's a good idea to have somebody from, from the political right uh, who, is an, who is an atheist because otherwise right. there's a confusion of, of, of values which, yeah. which doesn't help us and it's, yeah. it's much better to, to have this diversity in, in other areas. But I think I sort of do agree with you uh, but even if I didn't, I think it was valuable to have that. Right, right. If one could make one change, and only one, mine would be to distinguish the numinous from the supernatural. Yes. Right. Um, you had a marvelous quotation from Francis Collins, the, the genome pioneer, who said, you know, while mountaineering one day, he was just <laughs> overcome by the landscape. Mm -hmm. And then w went down to, on his knees and accepted Jesus Christ, a complete non sequitur. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's never even yeah. been suggested that Jesus Christ created that landscape. Right. A, f a frozen waterfall in three yeah, three, streams, three parts, yes, which yeah. would be the mind of the Trinity. Well, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're all triune in one way or another. Yeah. We're programmed for that. That's very clear. Um, the, the wouldn't, it wouldn't ever have been a four-headed God. Right. <laughs> um, you know that from experience. But that, that would be an enormous distinction to make, and I think it would clear up a lot of people's confusion that, this, that, the, that what we have in our emotions, that the surplus value of our personalities, the bits that aren't particularly useful for our evolution, or that we can't prove are, but that do belong to us all the same. Don't, don't belong to the supernatural and are not to be conscripted or annexed by any priesthood. Yes, it's, it's, it's a sad fact that people, in a sense, won't trust their own valuing of their numinous experiences. They think it isn't really as good as it seems unless it's, unless it's from God, unless it's in some kind of a proof of religion. No, right. it's, it's just as wonderful as it seems. It's just as important. It is the best moment in your life. And it's the moment when you, you forget yourself and become better than you ever thought you could be in some way. And see in, in all humbleness the wonderfulness of, the, of nature. That's, that's it. And that's wonderful. But it doesn't add anything to say, golly, that has to have been given to me by somebody even more wonderful. It's been well, hijacked, hasn't it? Yeah, well, it's, also, yes. it's also, I'm afraid, yeah. it's a, I think it's, yeah. a, I think it's a, a, a deformity or a shortcoming in, in the human personality, frankly, because the religion keeps stressing how humble it is and how meek it is and how accepting and um, almost to the point of self-abnegation it is. But actually it makes extraordinarily arrogant claims for these right. moments. It says right. that, I suddenly realized that the universe was all about me. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, and yeah. felt terrifically yeah. humble about it. Yeah. Come on. You know, we, have, we can laugh people out of that, I believe. Right. Yeah. Also, and, 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 and I think, and I think we must. should. I am so tired of the, uh, uh, if only Professor Dennett had the humility to blah, blah, blah. Yes. Humility, humility. <laughs> and this from people of 
breathtaking arrogance. Yeah. I think yeah. I, I shove one aside, saying, yeah. "This is just uh, don't mind me. I'm on an errand for God." Yeah, right. <laughs> well, this is a point. How modest is yeah. that? Yeah. This yeah. is the yeah. point. I think we should return to this notion of the yeah. arrogance of science, oh, because um, yeah. there, there, there is no discourse which enforces humility more rigorously. I mean, scientists, in my experience, are the the first people to say they don't know. I mean, if you get if yeah. you get, if you get a scientist to start talking mm -hmm. off his area of specialization, he immediately starts he or she immediately starts hedging his bet, saying, you know, I'm not, you know, but I'm sure there's someone in the room who knows more about this than me, and and of course, so, you know, all the data is not in. I mean, it's, it's, this this is the 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 mode of discourse in which we are most candid about the the, the scope of our ignorance. Well, actually, a lot of academics uh, come up with that kind of false modesty. But I do know well, what yeah, you mean. Yes, it is. Many's the story that says, no, I, right. I yield. It's just someone no, but any but academic should do that. Any yes, they right. should. But the the yeah. thing about religious people is that they recite the Nicene Creed every week, which says precisely what they, they believe. There are three gods, not one. The Virgin Mary, um, Jesus died, went to the, what was this, down for three days and then came up again. Yeah. I mean, yes. In precise detail. And yet they have the gall to accuse us of being overconfident. Yeah. And, yeah. and of... And and, of and, not knowing how, what it is to doubt. And, and I don't think many of them ever let themselves contemplate the question which I think scientists ask themselves all the time. What if I'm wrong? Yeah. What yeah. if I'm wrong? I mean, yeah. uh, it's just not part of their repertory. Actually, would you mind if I disagree with you about that? I mean, oh, a, lot yeah. of, a lot of the uh, talk that makes religious people hard to... Uh, not hard to beat, but hard to argue with, is precisely that they'll say they're in a permanent crisis of faith. There is indeed a prayer, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Graham Greene right. says the great thing about being a Catholic was that it was a challenge to his unbelief. A lot of people live by keeping two sets of books. In fact, yes. it's my impression. Yeah, that's the risk. In my impression, it's my impression in fact, that a, a majority of the people I know who call themselves believers or people of faith do that all the time. I wouldn't say it was schizophrenia. That would, be, that would be rude. Mm. But, but so they, they're quite aware of the implausibility of what they say. They, they don't act on it when they go to the doctor or when they travel or anything of right, this kind. Right. But in some sense, they couldn't be without it. But they're, they're quite respectful of the idea of doubt. In fact, they, make a, they try and build it in when they can. Well, that's interesting then. And so when they are reciting the creed with its, with its total sort of apparent conviction, is this a, this a kind of mantra which is forcing themselves to overcome doubt by saying, yes, I do believe, I do believe, I do yeah. believe, uh, because sure, really and, I and, don't. And, and, yeah. and, and, and of course, like, yeah. the, others, like the, the secular counterparts, they're glad other people believe it. It's an, it's an affirmation they wouldn't yes. want other people yes. not to be making. Well, yeah. also there's this, there's this curious bootstrapping move, which I, I tried to point out in this, in this recent On Faith piece, this, this idea that you start with the premise that belief without evidence is especially noble. I mean, this is the doctrine of, of faith. This is the, you know, the parable of yeah. Doubting Thomas. And so you start with that, and then you add this notion, which has come to me through various debates, that, that the, the fact that people can believe without evidence is itself a subtle form of evidence. I mean, we're kind of wired. To, actually, Francis Collins, you mentioned, mm. brings this up in his book. We're, we're, the fact that we have this intuition of God is itself some subtle form of evidence. And this is a kind of kindling phenomenon where if, once you say yeah, yeah. it's good to start without evidence, the fact that you can is a subtle form of evidence, and then the demand for any more evidence is itself a kind of corruption of the intellect or a temptation or something to be guarded against. And you get a kind of perpetual motion machine of self-deception where you can, you can get this thing up and running. But they, they like the idea that it can't be demonstrated because there'd be, then there'd be nothing to be faithful about. Right. And That's if the everyone, point of faith. Yeah. If everyone had seen yeah, the resurrection... Yeah. And we all knew uh, that we, we'd been saved by it. So, well, then we would be living in an unalterable system of belief, and it would have to be policed. Um, right. Well, actually, and it would actually be, those of us who don't believe in it are very glad it's not true because we think it would be horrible. Those who do believe it don't want it to be absolutely proven so there can't be any doubt about it because then there's no, exactly. there's no wrestling Somebody, with the conscience. There are no dark nights of the soul. It was a review of one of, one of our books. I don't remember which, but it was exactly that point that, that just... What a crass uh, expectation on the part of atheists that, that there should be total evidence for this. I mean, this, that there would there'd be much less magic. You know, if, everyone, if everyone was compelled to believe by too much evidence... Actually, this is Francis Collins. I'm yes. sorry. This yeah. is, this is well, Francis my, Collins. A friend of mine, Canon Fenton of Oxford, yeah. actually, mm. said that if the, if they, if the uh, church v validated the Holy Shroud of Turin, he personally would leave. 
<laughs> the ranks. Because if, right. if they were doing things like that, he didn't want any part of it. Right. Um, the, That's too I didn't expect when I started off my book tour uh, to be as lucky as I was. I mean, Jerry Falwell died in my first week on the road. That was amazing. Yes, that was amazing. <laughs> um, I didn't expect Mother Teresa to come out as an atheist. Yes. Uh, <laughs> sort of, but reading her letters, which I now have, Oh. It's, it's rather interesting. She writes, I can't bring myself to believe any of this. She tells all her confessors, all her superiors. I can't hear a voice. I can't feel a presence, even in the mass, even mm -hmm. in the sacraments. No small thing. And they write back to her saying, that's good. Right. That's great. Right. You're suffering. It gives you a share in the yeah. crucifixion. It makes you part of Calvary. Yeah. You can't beat uh, an argument like that. Right. The less yeah. you believe it, the more your illustration. The more it, it, you prove it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and the, and the struggle, the, the the dark night of the soul, is the proof in itself. Yeah. So we just have to realize that these really are non-overlapping magisteria. We can't, we can't hope to argue with a mentality of this kind. Well, I, uh, we, no, we, no, we, but, but we can there. do we can do just what you're doing now, and that is, we can say, look at this interesting bag of tricks that have evolved. Notice that they are, they're circular, that they're self-sustaining, that they don't have any, that they could be about anything. And, and then you don't argue with them. You simply point out that these are not, these are not uh, valid ways of, of thinking about anything. Uh, because you, can, right. you could use the very same tricks to sustain something which was manifestly fraudulent. And in fact, mm -hmm. what fascinates me is that a lot of the tricks are, they have their counterparts with con artists. They, yeah. they use the very same forms of non-argument, the very same non-sequiturs, and they make, for instance, they make a virtue out of trust. And, and as soon as you start ex exhibiting any suspicion of the, of the con man who's about, he gets all hurt on you, and, and, uh, and uh, plays the hurt feelings card, and reminds you how wonderful taking it on faith is, and how, yes. I, I mean, there aren't any, there aren't any new tricks. There, these tricks have evolved yeah. over And over you want, one could years. add the production of bogus special effects as well, which mm. is yeah, a, yeah. one of the things that completely convicts religion of being fraudulent, the, right. the, the, the belief in the miraculous. The same people will no. say, well, Einstein felt a spiritual force in the universe when he said the whole point about it is there are no miracles, the, 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 there are no uh, it, it, uh, changes in the natural order. That's the miraculous right. thing. They, right. they're, they're completely cynical about claiming him. Well, the, the other thing, uh, worth the same, out almost the same breath, is that the, the, these mm -hmm. every religious person stands uh, feels the same criticism of other people's faith that we do as atheists. I yep. mean, they, they reject the pseudo miracles and the, and the pseudo claims to yep, certainty yep. of others, uh, and they see the confidence tricks in other people's faith. Yep. And they, they see it rather readily. Yep. You know, every yep. Christian knows the Quran can't be the perfect word of the creator of the universe, and anyone who thinks it is hasn't read it closely enough, and it's just in this hermetically sealed discourse I that isn't that. really being self-critical. Uh, and I think we, we're on very strong, we make a very strong case when we point that out, and point out also that whatever people are experiencing in church or in prayer, no matter how positive, the fact that Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and Christians are all experiencing it proves <laughs> that it can't be a matter of the divinity of Jesus or the unique sanctity of the yeah. Quran. Or because because the, there's the 17 different right. ways of exactly. getting there. Yeah. 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 By the way, on that, a tiny point, it's not, I hope not a digression. It's, it's useful bearing that in mind too when you get, as I did this morning on ABC News, uh, the question, well, wouldn't you say religion did some good in the world? I mean, there were good people. You never don't get that argument. And by, yeah. the, by the way, there's no reason why one shouldn't. You say, well, Yes, I have indeed heard it said that Hamas provides social services in Gaza. Right. And I've even heard it said that Louis Farrakhan's group right. gets young black men in prison off drugs. I don't know if it's true. I'm, I'm willing to accept it might be. Right. It doesn't alter the fact that the one is a, a militarized terrorist organization with a fanatical anti-Semitic ideology, and the second is a racist crackpot cult. Yeah. And the and other I have no doubt that Scientology gets people off drugs, too. But, yeah. uh, but you, uh, my, yeah. my insistence always with these people is if you will claim it for one, you must accept it for them all. And if the you other move you can make you, there is if you don't, it's flat out dishonest. You yeah. can invent a, an ideology which, by your mere invention in that moment, is obviously untrue, which would be quite useful if propagated to billions. I mean, uh, when in, That's uh, right. you could say, uh, this is my new religion. Teach people to 
demand that your children study science and math and economics and all of our terrestrial disciplines to the best of their abilities. And if they don't persist in those efforts, they'll be tortured after death by 17 demons. Um, this would be extremely useful, I and mean, it'd be far more useful than Islam, propagated to billions. And yet, what are the chances that the 17, bil yeah. 17 demons exist? You know, yeah. Zero. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a slipperiness, too, isn't there, about uh, one way of speaking to sophisticated intellectuals and theologians and another way of speaking to congregations and, above all, <coughs> children. And I think we've all of us been accused of uh, going after the easy targets of the Jerry yeah. Falwells of this world and ignoring the sophisticated yeah. uh, professors yes. of theology. And I mean, I don't know what you feel about that, but one of the things I feel is that the sophisticated professors of theology will say one thing to each other and to in intellectuals generally but will say something totally different to a congregation. They'll, they'll talk about miracles, they'll talk about... Well, they won't um, talk to a congregation. <laughs> well, oh, and, and, and archbishops fact, will. Uh, yes, but, but when the sophisticated theologians try to talk to the preachers, the preachers won't have any of it. Well, that's, that's yeah, true. Of I mean, yeah, the, the, yeah. you've got to realize that sophisticated theology is like stamp collecting. It's a very specialized thing, and only a few people do it. And a and negligible they influence. In, they take in, in their own laundry, and, uh, and uh, they... Uh, get all excited about some very arcane details and their own tr religions pay almost no attention to what they're saying. Uh, a little bit of it does, of course, filter in, but it always gets beefed up again for general consumption uh, because what they say in their writings, at least from my experience, is uh, eye-glazing, mind-twisting, uh, very subtle things which have no particular bearing on life. Oh, no, I must insist. I must, I must say a good word here for Professor Alistair McGrath, who in his attack on, uh, on Richard said, it's not true, as we've always been told, and most people, m most Christians believe, that Tertullian said, credo quae absurdum, I, queer absurdum, I believe it because it's ridiculous. No, it turns out, I've checked this now, though McGrath, I don't know this in McGrath, uh, that in fact, Tertullian said, um, the impossibility of it is the thing that makes it the most believable. That's a well worth, well, distinction, I think. <laughs> and very useful for training the one's mind. In the to very useful for uh, training yes. one's mind in the fine points. Uh, it, it, it's it's the, the likelihood, in other words, that it could have been made up right. is diminished by the incredibility of it. Who would yeah. try and invent something that was that so unbelievable? Yeah, that's, well, you, you, know, that, you make that some very actually, good points that actually on is, That actually yeah. is, that's a good I point. think, a mm. debate perfectly yeah. well worth having. Mm. What I say to these people is this. You're sending your, your email or your letter to the wrong address. Everyone says, let's not judge religion by its fundamentalists. All right. Take the Church of England. Um, two of whose senior leaders recently said that the floods in North Yorkshire were the result of homosexual behavior. Not in North Yorkshire, presumably, right. but probably in London, I think they're thinking. <laughs> so, but God's aim is a little one off. Of, one of these, the Bishop of Carlisle, is apparently about to be the next Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, this is extraordinary. This is supposed to be the, the mild and reflective and thoughtful and rather you know, troubled church, making fanatical pronouncements. Well, I want to hear what Alistair McGrath is going to write to the Bishop of Carlisle, not to me. Hmm. Is no, he going to no. say, ex my Lord Bishop... Do you not realize what a complete idiot you've, you're making of yourself and of our church? Did he do this? If he did it in private, I'm not, I'm not impressed. He should, has to say it in public. The Bishop Why are they of telling me to, I will judge the church by the sp yes. statements of its bishops. I think no. I'm allowed to. Yeah. Yeah. But the other thing is that, never mind about the, the academic theologians, bishops and, and vicars, who will attack us for taking... Uh, scriptures, or, or for accusing people of taking scriptures literally, and of course, yeah. of course we don't believe the book of Genesis literally, and yet they do preach about what Adam and Eve did, as though they, were, as though they did exist, as though there's somehow, it's a sort of license to yeah. talk about yeah. things which they know, and anybody of any sophistication mm. knows, is fiction, and yet they will treat their congregations, their sheep, um, as though they did exist, as though they were factual, and a huge number of those congregations actually think they did exist. Can you imagine any one of these preachers saying, as such a topic is introduced, um, this is a sort of theoretical fiction. 
It's yes. not true, but it's, but it's a very fine metaphor. No, they're, they're, they're just they not They kind of, going. after the fact, imply that that's what they, uh, that, what that's, they expect you to know. Right? Yes, but, but, they, but yeah. they would never announce um, it. They would well, never there's say. another point there, is that they never admit how they have come to, to stop taking it literally. Mm. Because they, they, you have all these people criticizing us for our crass literalism. We're as, we're as fundamentalist as the fundamentalists. And yet, these moderates don't admit how they have come to be moderate. What does moderation consist of? It consists of uh, having lost faith in all of these propositions, or half of them, yep. because of just the hammer blows of science and, and secular politics. Of the and, and crass nationality. literalism of the critics. Yeah, yeah. It's, right. they, the religion has lost its mandate on a, a thousand questions. And moderates tend to, to argue that this is somehow a triumph of faith, that faith is somehow self uh, enlightening, whereas it's been enlightened from the outside. It has been, you know, we've had a, it has been intruded upon by On science. that point that I was wanting to raise myself about the, our own uh, so-called fundamentalism, there's a cleric in Southwark, the, the first person I saw attacking you and I in print as being just as fundamentalist as those who blew up the London Underground. Do you remember oh, his I, name? I, I don't remember his name. You, uh, I had a, uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember. He's a very senior Anglican cleric in the Diocese of Southwark. I went on the BBC with him. Just o entre parenthèses, I'll say, the, when I'd said, how, how, can, how can you call your congregation a flock? Doesn't that say everything about your religion, that you think right. they're sheep? He said, well, actually, I used to be a, a pastor in New Guinea. <laughs> where there aren't any sheep. Well, of course, there are a lot of places where there are no sheep. Gospel's quite hard to teach, as a result. Uh, we found out what the most um, important animal to the locals was, and I remember Pigs. very well my local um, bishop rising to uh, ask the divine one to uh, behold these swine, <laughs> his, his, con his new congregation. Um, but he, this is the man who deliberately does a thing like that, that's as cynical as you could wish, and as adaptive as the day is long, and he says that we who doubt it are as fundamentalists as people who blow up their fellow citizens on the, on the London Underground. It's, it's unconscionable. Thus, I don't really mind being accused of ridiculing or treating with contempt people like that. I just frankly have no choice. I, 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 I have the faculty of humor, and some of it has an edge to it. I'm not going to repress that uh, for the sake of uh, politeness of people. Would you think that... It would be good to make a distinction between the professionals and the amateurs. I share your uh, impatience with the officials of the churches, the, the pr people who this is their professional life. Mm. It seems to me they know better. Right. The congregations don't know better because the, it's maintained that they should not know better. The con I... I do get very anxious about ridiculing the beliefs of the flock because of the way in which they have ceded to their leaders. Uh, they've, they've delegated authority to their leaders and they presume their leaders are going to do it right. So I think in this, uh, uh, you know, who takes, the, who stands up and says the buck stops here? Right. Well, it seems to me it's, it's, it's the preachers themselves, it's the priests, it's the bishops, and, and we really should hold their feet to the fire. For instance, let, uh, just take, take the issue of creationism. If somebody in a fundamentalist church thinks that creationism is, makes sense because their pastor told them, well, uh, I, can, I can understand that and excuse that. We all, we all get a lot of what we take to be true from people that we respect and whom we view as authorities. We don't mm -hmm. check everything out. But where did the pastor get this idea? And I don't care where he is, he or she is responsible because their job is to know what they're talking about in a way that the uh, congregation is. We have to be a little bit careful not to sound condescending when we say that. And, and in a way, it's reflecting the condescension yep. of the, of the mm. preacher. Yes, because mm. I'll, I'll, I'll take things that you and Richard say on the human and natural sciences, not without wanting to check, but I'm often unable to, but knowing that you are the sort of gentleman who would have checked. If you say, the bishop told me it, so I believe it, you make a fool of yourself, it seems to me, yeah. and one is entitled to say so. 
just as one is entitled when dealing with an ordinary racist to say that his opinions are revolting. Uh, right. he, may be, he may know no better, but that's not going to save him from my condemnation. And nor should it. And I, I think exactly it's condescending not, not to confront people, as it were, one by one or en masse. So but it public, is public opinion is, well, is often wrong. Mob opinion is almost always wrong. Let's Religious, opinion is wrong. Religious opinion is wrong by definition. We can't, we can't avoid this. Conf and I, I wanted to intr intrude the name H.L. Mencken at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now a very unjustly celebrated American writer. Um, not particularly to my taste, much too much of a Nietzschean. Mm -hmm. and, and what really was once meant by social Darwinists. Right. At one stage, but he, why did he win the tremendous respect of so many people in this country in the 20s and 30s? Because he said the people who believe what the Methodists tell them and what William Jennings Bryan tells them are fools. They're not being fooled. They are fools. They should shame they're, on they're, them they're, for they're, believing these. Yes, yeah. it's yeah. Un, they, they make themselves undignified and ignorant, and no mincing of words here, and a great admixture of wit and evidence and reasoning. Mm -hmm. It absolutely works. It's the most successful anti-religious polemic that's probably ever been in the modern world. I in the 20th I, century, anyway. I think we just touched upon an issue that we should really um, highlight. This whole yeah. notion of authority. Because yeah. religious people often argue that science is just a, a tissue of, of uh, uncashed checks. You know, we're, we're all yeah, yeah. relying on authority. How do you know that, that uh, the cosmological constant is whatever it is? You know, it, so... How, I think you two are, are well placed to do this. Differentiate the kind of faith placing in authority that we practice without fear in science and, and rationality generally, and the kind of faith placing in the, the preacher or the theologian that we, we criticize. Well, what we actually do when, when we who are not physicists take on trust what physicists say is we, uh, we have some evidence to suggest that physicists have looked into the matter, that they've done experiments, that they've peer-reviewed mm. their, their, their papers, um, that they've criticized each other, that they've been subjected to massive criticism from their peers in seminars and in, in lectures and things. There's, and you, they've come through. And, 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 and remember the structure that's there, too. Mm. It's not just that there's peer review, but it's very important that it's competitive. For instance, when uh, uh, Fermat's last theorem was proved by right. Andrew uh, Wiles. Wiles. Andrew yeah. Wiles. Um, the reason that those of us who, <laughs> forget it, I'm never going to understand that proof, mm. uh, but the reason that we can be confident that it really is a proof is that nobody wanted e him to get every there first. other yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mathematician who was competent <laughs> in the world was, was very well motivated to study to that. Yeah. And, and, and believe me, if they, if they begrudge him that this is a proof, it's a proof. Yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing like that in, nothing like that. No, because we're the religion. antithesis yeah. of no, that. No, no, religious, no religious person has ever been able to say, say what Einstein said. If, if, yeah. if I'm right, the following solar event will occur off the west coast of Africa in I forget how many mm. years and months right. from now, and it, and it did within a very tiny degree of variation. There's never been a prophecy that's been vindicated yeah. like, like yeah. that, or, or anyone willing Yep. to um, place their reputation yep. and their, as it were, their life on the idea that it would be. I, I was once asked uh, at, at a public meeting, don't you think that the mysteriousness of quantum theory is just the same as the mysteriousness of the mm. trinity or the transubstantiation? Yes. And the answer, of course, is, is, can be answered in two quotes from Richard Feynman. One Richard Feynman said, uh, if you think you understand quantum theory, you don't understand quantum theory. He was admitting that it's highly mysterious. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is that the, the predictions of quantum theory experimentally are verified to the I equivalent of predicting the width of North America to the width of one human hair. Right. And so <laughs> quantum theory is massively yeah. supported yeah. by yeah. accurate predictions, even if you don't understand the mystery of, of, of the Copenhagen interpretation, or whatever it is. Right. Whereas the mystery of the Trinity doesn't even try to make a prediction, let alone an accurate one. You know, I don't like... It doesn't, isn't a mystery either. I don't, I don't like the use of the word mystery here. Yes. I think, I think uh, this has been, there's been a lot of consciousness raising in philosophy about this term, mm -hmm. where we have so-called mysterians, the new mysterians. These are people who like the term mystery. Uh, Noam Chomsky is famously uh, quoted to say, there's, there's two kinds of questions. There's puzzles and mysteries. Puzzles are soluble. Mysteries aren't. Mm. And 
first of all, I, I just don't buy that, but I buy the... I buy the distinction and say, there's nothing about mystery in science. There's, there's puzzles, there's deep puzzles, there's things we don't know, there's things we'll never know, but they aren't systematically incomprehensible to human beings. The, the, the glorification of the idea that these things are, are systematically incomprehensible is, I think, uh, has, has no place in, in science. Which is why I think we should be quite uh, happy to revive traditional terms in our discourse, such as obscurantism and obfuscation, mm -hmm. is what they read mm -hmm. really and, and to point out that these things can make intelligent people uh, act stupidly. Uh, John Cornwell has just written another, okay. another attack on yourself, Richard, and who is an old friend of mine, a very brilliant guy, wrote one of the best studies of the Catholic Church and fascism that has been published. Mm -hmm. He's, in his review of you, he says, Mr. Daw Professor Dawkins should just look at the shelves of books there are on the Trinity. The library is full yeah. of attempts to solve this problem yeah. before he's so... Yeah. But none of the books in those religious libraries solve it either. Yeah. Yeah. It, the whole point is that it remains insoluble and is used to keep people feeling baffled and inferior. Yeah. But I want to come back to the thing about mystery in, in, in physics because isn't it possible that our evolved brains, because we, we evolved in what I call middle world, where, where um, we, we never have to cope with the, either the very small or the cosmologically very large, mm. we may never actually have an intuitive feel for what's going on in quantum mechanics, but yep. we can still test its predictions. Yep. We can still actually yep. do the mathematics and do the physics to actually test the predictions, because anybody can read the dials on a... Right. I think, I think <laughs> what, what we can see is that um, what scientists have constructed over the, over the centuries is a series of tools, mind tools, thinking tools, mathematical tools, and so forth, which enable us to some degree to overcome the limitations of our evolved brains, our our uh, uh, Stone Age, if you like, brains. And overcoming those limitations is not always direct. Sometimes you have to give up something. You, yes, you'll just never be able to, as you say, to be able to think intuitively about this. But you can know that even though you can't yeah. think intuitively yeah, right. about it, there's this, there's this laborious process by which you can, mm. you can make progress and you do have to uh, cede a certain authority to the process, but you can test that. Mm. And it can carry you from A to B in the same way if you're, you yes. know, if you're a, a quadriplegic, a, 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 an artificial device can carry you from A to B. doesn't mean you can walk from A to That's B, right. but you can get yeah. from A to right. B. Yes. Right. And the, the bolder physicists will say, well, who cares about intuition? I mean, just look at the math. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah and, that's uh, right. Yeah. They, they are... They are comfortable with yeah. their with living living with their with yes. their prostheses. Well, the perfect yes, example of that is is just dimensions beyond mm. three, because we, we yeah, can't yeah, visualize right. a yes. fourth dimension or yeah. a fifth. Yeah. But it's trivial to represent it mathematically, yeah. yes. so we, we can move. And into now other and now we teach our undergraduates how to manipulate n-dimensional spaces and to think about right. vector vectors vectors in n-dimensional spaces, and they get used to the fact they can't quite. Ima what you do is you imagine three of them and say, you wave your hand a little bit and say, more of the same. Yeah. And, but, you, you, but you check your intuition by running the maths and it works. But it's, it's easy to do something, say you're a psychologist looking at personality and you say there are, yeah. there are 15 dimensions of personality and you could think of them as being 15 dimensions in, could, s yeah. in space. Yeah. And, and anybody can see that, that you're, you, can, you can imagine moving along any one of those dimensions right. um, with respect to the, to the others and you don't actually have to visualize 15 dimensional space. No. That's and you give up that demand and you yes, realize yes. I, I can live without that it would be nice if I could do that, but hey, I can't see bacteria with the naked eye either. I can live without that. But I think yeah. there's one. Yeah, I was challenged oh, no. on the, I was challenged on the radio the other day by someone. Can't who see bacteria. He had to be fairly quiet. No, said I, he, that I believed in atoms on no evidence because I'd never seen one. 
Um, not since George Galloway said to me that, that he'd never seen a barrel of oil. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. That yeah, is it, well, it is, cute. It's, but it, you realize that people at this point, they're wearing themselves right, right down to their uppers. I mean, they're desperate when they get to the state. Yeah. Yeah. The reason I say it is because I think it could, I don't want us to make our lives easier, but it makes the argument a little more simple. We are quite willing to say there are many things we don't know. What right. Haldane, I think it was, said, you know, the universe is not just queerer than we understand, it's queerer than we can understand. Um, we, look for, we know there'll be great new discoveries. We, we know we'll live to see great things, but we know there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Mm. That's the whole distinction. The, the, the believer has to say not just that there is a God, the, the deist position, that there may be a mind at work in the universe, mm -hmm. a, a proposition we can't disprove, but the, they know that mind exactly. and can yeah. interpret it. They're on good terms with it. Yes, have, they get yes. occasional revelations. They from have it. a book that is get verbatim briefings from. Brief. It. Get, yes. Now, th this you, any yeah, decent yeah. argument, any decent intellect, has to begin by excluding people who claim to know more than they can possibly know. Yeah. You start yeah. off by saying, yeah. "Well, that's wrong." To begin with, now can we get on with it? Yeah. So theism's gone in the first round. Yeah. 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 It's off the island. Exactly. It's that, out of the show. <laughs> that's a footnote I wanted to add to what Dan was saying. Even if mystery was somehow something we had to just, a bitter pill we have to swallow in the end. We, we are cognitively closed to the, to the yeah. truth at some level. That still doesn't give any scope to theism. Absolutely it's, not, because, because, and, because and, it's just as the close to them as it is to and they, those who and, 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 and they, they claim perfect transparency of revelation. And also they, they, so. can't, they can't be allowed to forget what they used to say when they were strong enough to get away with it. Exactly. Yeah. Which is, this is really true right. in every detail. And if you and don't believe it, we'll kill we'll you. Kill you. Yes, yeah. Yeah. We'll kill you, and it may take some days to kill you, but right. we, we, we'll, yes, we we'll will get the job slowly. done. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We, they wouldn't have the power they have now if they hadn't had the power they had then. Right. And you know, this, what you just said, Christopher, um, actually, I think, strikes terror, strikes anxiety in a lot of uh, uh, religious hearts, because it just hasn't been brought home to them that this move of theirs is just off limits. It's just not, it's not the game. It's not, it doesn't, you can't do that. And they've been taught all their lives that they, you can do that. This is, this is a legitimate way of, of conducting a discussion. And here suddenly we're just telling them, I'm sorry, that is not a move in this game. In fact, it is a disqualifying move. Right. And they're, precisely they the find move that you can't be respected they, for making. Yeah, I'm, yes. Uh, the, just adumbrate the move for me a bit, if you would, or for us. Um, Perhaps only for me. Somebody, say what you think that somebody, move is. Somebody plays the faith card. Yes. They say, look, I, I am a Christian, and we Christians, we just have to believe this, and it, you know, that's it. At which point, the, I guess the polite way of saying it is, well, okay, if that's true, you'll just have to excuse yourself from the discussion because you've, de you've declared yourself incompetent okay. to proceed uh, uh, with an open mind. Now, if that's you what really, I can't, what I if you really can't, if you really can't uh, defend your view, then sorry, you can't put it forward. We're not going to let you play the faith card. Now, if you want to defend what your holy book says in terms that we can appreciate, fine. But... Because it says it in the holy book, that just doesn't cut any ice at all. And if you think it does, you're clearly, that is, first of all, that's just arrogant. It is, it is, it is a bullying move, and we're just not going to accept it. And it's a move that they don't accept when, when exactly. done in the name of another faith. Exactly. Which but now, in which case, could I ask you something, all three of you to, who are wiser than I on this matter, uh, what do we think of Victor Stenger's book that says that we can now scientifically disprove the existence of God? Do you have a view? Which of God? This? I haven't read the book. Which God? Which, the God any, of the any, any kind of any, uh, either any a creating kind. one uh, or a supervising one, and certainly an intervening one. I mean, I think uh, I think that's fairly exhaustive. Hmm. I, my view had always been that since we have to live with uncertainty, only those who are certain leave the room before the discussion can become adult. Hmm. Victor Stenger seems to think now we've got to the stage where we can say with reasonable confidence there's. It's, it's disproved, not as not vindicated or, um, or better explanation proposed. But just, I just thought it'd be an interesting proposition because it matters a lot to me yeah. that um, 
our, our opinions are, con are congruent with uncertainty. Right. Well, well I think the weak and link... And with doubt. Yeah, I, I, I was a big fan of his book and actually uh, blurbed it, but um, I think the weakest link is the, this foundational claim on the text, the, this idea that the, we know that the Bible is the perfect word of an omniscient deity, because that, that, is, the, that is an especially weak claim, and it really is the claim, it is really the, the, the gold in their, their epistemological gold standard. I mean, it all rests on, on that, that if the Bible is not a magic book, Christianity, in this case, evaporates. If the Quran is not the, a magic book, Islam evaporates. And when you look at the books and ask yourself, is there the slightest shred of evidence that this is the product of omniscience? Is there a single sentence in here that could not have been uttered by a person for whom a wheelbarrow would have been you know, emergent technology? You have to say, no. I mean, it's just, there's not, if the Bible had an account of DNA and electricity and other yeah, things yeah. that would astonish us, yeah. Then okay, our yeah. jaws drop uh, suitably, and we have to yeah. to have a, a, a sensible conversation about the source of this knowledge. You know, Dinesh D'Souza makes this claim in his new book. He's going to be, I, by the way, one of the m much more uh, literate and well-read and educated uh, of our antagonists. Uh, hmm. I'm going to be debating soon. He says that in Genesis, when which people used to mock, they said, "Let there be light," and then only a few staves later, you get the sun and the moon and the stars. Right. How how could that be? Well, yeah. that's actually, according to the Big Bang, that would be right. Yeah, but that's The bang pathetic. precedes the galaxies. Yeah, we have. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, be, believe me, yeah. I it <laughs> yeah, right, too. But, um, right. Well, I try to demonstrate <coughs> this, this, this cast of mind in, I think, a very long end note in the end of faith where I say any text can be read. Well, with the eyes of faith, you can make magical prescience out of any text. So I, I literally walked into a bookstore, it, the cookbook aisle of a bookstore, randomly opened a cookbook, found a, a recipe for wok, wok, I think it was wok sheer, uh, seared shrimp with ogo relish or something, and then came up with a mystical interpretation of the recipe. And you can do it. I mean, you can connect, play, connect the dots with any mm -hmm. crazy mm -hmm. text well, Michael and find Shama, wisdom in it. Michael Shama did it with the Bible code. Right, I haven't seen yeah. that. The hidden yeah. messages in the, in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very yeah. good. You, you can absolutely, you can write yesterday's headlines yep. from it right. any time you like. Yeah. I, I have a question for the three of you. Is there any argument for faith, any challenge to your atheism that has given you pause, that has sent you back on your heels where you felt you're, you didn't have a ready answer, etc. I actually, I actually can't think of any. I mean, I think the closest yeah, yeah, is, the, yeah. is the idea that the, uh, the fundamental constants of the universe are too good to be true. And yeah. uh, that uh, that does seem to me to need some kind of explanation if it's true. I think, I mean, Victor Stenger doesn't think it is true, but, but many physicists do. I don't think, I mean, it certainly doesn't in any way suggest to me a creative intelligence because you're still left with the problem of explaining where that came from. Right. Um, yes. And uh, a creative intelligence who's sufficiently creative and intelligent enough to fine-tune the constants of the universe to give rise to us has got to be a lot more fine-tuned himself than... Yeah, than why, why create all the other planets in our solar system dead. Yeah. Well, that's a separate question. Yeah, say, well, if it was that good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. uh, yeah. uh, Bishop Montefiore was very good at this, was a, was a former friend of mine, and said, you have to marvel at the conditions of life and the knife edge on which they are. I said, well, it is a knife edge, yes. Our planet is yes. a lot of it too hot or too cold. Right it's now, not a climate. Uh, the other, the other planets are yeah. completely too hot or too cold to support life. And that's just one solar system, the only one we know about where there is life. Not much of a designer. And of course, you can't get out of the infinite regress. But I no, I've, I've not come across a single persuasive argument of that kind. But I wouldn't have expected to, because as I realized when I thought one evening, they never come up with anything new. Well, why would they? Their arguments are very old by definition. And they were all evolved when we knew very, very little about the natural order. The only argument that I find at all attractive, and this is for faith, you asked, as well as for yeah. theism is what I, would, I, guess, I suppose I'd call the apotropaic, the, when people say uh, all the praise belongs to God for this. Um, he's to be thanked for all this. It is, that is actually a, a form of modesty. Hmm. It's a superstitious one, that's why I say apotropaic, but right. it's, 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 a, it's avoiding hubris. It's also for that reason, obviously pre-monotheistic, but um, religion does or can help people to avoid hubris, I think.
mm. morally, mm. intellectually, and I, um, that that might be a. But that's small not an argument that it's true. Oh, for heaven's no. sake! No, 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 there, no, 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 no there no. aren't. There are and cannot be any such arguments. I think. Well, maybe I should broaden well, this question. No, no, wait a minute. Um, I think. Ah. But before <laughs> you answer, Dan, I, I, I could give you several, several uh, discoveries which would shape my faith let me, right, right to no, the no, ground. No, no, but let me just broaden the question. Yeah, yeah. Not only... Rabbits uh, in the free Cambrian. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> the, not only a, uh, an no. argument for the plausibility of religious belief, but an argument that suggests that what we're up to, criticizing faith, is a bad thing. Oh, that's faith. much easier. So we shouldn't be doing So yeah. let's, let's, ex let's oh, exclude okay. that. Yeah. Yeah. By all means. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, no. We shouldn't be doing what we're doing. That, that's, that, that's much easier. Okay. What's, it's easier to think of a... Oh, reason. I mean, it's, somebody could come up with an argument that says that the, that the world is a better place oh, and everybody that, yeah. believes a falsehood. Right. And, and, uh, yeah. um, is there any context, though, in your work or in dialogue with your critics where you feel that that argument has, has given you pause? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, uh, not so much in Breaking the Spell, but when I was working on my book on free will, uh, Freedom Evolves, mm. I kept running into critics who... Who, who were basically expressing something very close to a religious view, namely, look, shh, 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 free will is such an important idea. If we gave up the idea of free will, we would have, people would lose a sense of responsibility and we would have chaos. And you really don't want to uh, look too closely. Just avert your eyes. Do not look too closely at this issue of free will and determinism. And I thought about that in, explicitly in the uh, environmental impact category. Okay. Could I imagine that my uh, irrepressible curiosity could lead me to articulate something, true or false, dangerous. which would have such devastating effects on the world that I, that, that I should just shut up and change the subject? Yeah. And I think that's a good question that we all should ask. Yeah, good. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of time uh, thinking hard about that, and I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have published either of those two books if I hadn't come to the conclusion that it was, it was not only, as it were, environmentally safe to proceed this way, but obligatory. Mm. But, but I think you should ask that question. I do. Right. Before publishing a book, but not before deciding for yourself, do I think that this is true or not? Uh, you, you, one, one should never do what some politically motivated often critics do, which is to say, this is so politically obnoxious that it cannot be true, oh, yeah. which is a different, a different, oh, it's a different thing entirely. Yeah. No, no. 